Okay, this lecture is on DNS, which stands for Domain Name System. So, kind of one fact that should be review from uh, 161 is machines that are not on the same network communicate via their IP address. Um, however, if you had to remember IP addresses for, you know, Google, M365, KCTCS, that, that's not really easy for most humans. So what happens is names are associated with those IP addresses so that we can connect to netlab.kctcs.edu, for example, uh, or we can go to, to google.com. So with those two facts, um, the purpose of DNS is to map fully qualified domain names back and forth between IPs. Most of the time it's a lookup, which is you give a name, it's going to give you an IP address back. But you can do a reverse lookup and say, hey, I have this IP, does this machine have a name? Uh, the DNS standard was published in 1983, and it was first implemented, um, or its first implementation was BIND, uh, the Berkeley Internet Name Domain, in 1984. University of California, Berkeley did a lot of research and created a lot of software for uh, Unix. Um, during the, the 70s and 80s. So DNS is one of those things that they uh, created. So a little quick history of the internet and how many machines there were is in 1969 something called ARPANET was brought online and this is the predecessor uh, to or what grew into the internet. Uh, when ARPANET was first created, there were four nodes, which are locations. Uh, those nodes would have been UCLA, Stanford Research Institute, University of California, Santa Barbara, and University of Utah. And each of those sites or nodes had one computer, so four nodes, four hosts. Um, in October 29, 1969, uh, the first person tried to do a remote login, and that person was Charlie Klein of UCLA. He was going to connect to Stanford Research Institute, and he typed L-O-G for login, or starting to type login, and the system crashed. So that he was the first person to actually attempt to use uh, the, the internet. Uh, <clears throat> about a year later, in June of 1970, um, MIT, Harvard, BBN, and SDC uh, joined ARPANET. Uh, notice that two of these are uh, companies. That brought us to eight locations nine host so one of these locations um, or one of the uh, first four listed actually had two computers or two hosts um, at them uh, about six months later um, <clears throat> we have other notable people coming onto the internet that brings us to 15 sites and 23 computers in 1972, uh, we were at 24 nodes. I couldn't find out how many hosts total, uh, but probably not much more than, than 25 or 26. A year later, in 1973, there were 30 nodes. So a year goes by, we only added six locations to the internet. Uh, two years later, we actually double the number from 1973 with um, 61 nodes. And then a couple of years after that, 1977, the number of hosts on the Internet surpasses 100. Uh, seven years later, 
1994, we actually have a thousand hosts on the internet. And I actually remember uh, when when that happened. It was kind of a big deal at the time, kind of insignificant by today's numbers. Um, just a graph that shows you, you know, around 1975, 1976, we really had a spike up of people on the internet. Um, a lot of these were still um, universities and schools. Uh, continuing on, uh, just one, one piece of information before DNS was created in 1984. Most of the machines on the internet, if not all the machines on the internet, were Unix machines. So they had an Etsy host file. So periodically, that being once or twice a week, uh, you would go, I'm pretty sure it was on internet.net, internet uh, you would go to that website and just download the newest uh, host file. And you'd be like, wow, we, we passed 500. Wow, we passed 600. Uh, so that is the way you mapped fully qualified domain names back and forth between IPs was the Etsy host file. And the host file also uh, exists on Windows machine uh, when Windows was created because that was how that lookup was done um, in the day when Windows was created. So, um, continuing on, 1987, the number of hosts passes 10,000. Uh, a year later, we have 60,000 hosts. Um, a year after that, we pass 100,000 hosts. Uh, three years after that, we, we pass a million hosts. Four years after that, we pass 10 million. Four years after that, we pass uh, 100 million hosts. So our map now from 1984 on looks like this. And again, we have this big ramp at the end starting in the early 90s. And that is attributed to the fact that Tim Berners-Lee uh, created the web in 1989, but that it was not really heavily used until the first graphical web browser came out in 1992. And you can see at 1992 is when it really starts ramping up because businesses are getting on the internet and people have a nice graphical user interface to be able to navigate the web. In 2000, we pass 100 million. Seven years after that, we pass 500 million in 2007. Seven years after that, um, we pass a billion hosts on the internet. And then things kind of taper off. If we go five years past that, we've only gained um, 10 million new hosts. Um, and again, these are hosts with uh, DNS entries. Uh, so our graph now looks like this. We have continued growth through the early 2000s. And uh, around 2014, plus or minus, things start to level off. There's still growth, but not the really huge growth like we had seen uh, previously. So as far as the design of DNS. It's hierarchical in nature. Hierarchical means it looks like a upside down tree. So this is how things were designed. We, we have a root which is kind of this virtual top of the tree and then TLD stands for top level domain. So top level domains, we'll see a list in a minute, but would be like .com and .edu. Second level domain is kind of the main name of the entity. So, you know, for University of Kentucky, our top level domain is .edu. The second level domain is UKY. And then you can have subdomains under that, and this can go down as, as far as you need. For example, our College of Engineering has a machine called Skyhawk. It's fully qualified domain name. 
is skyhawk.eng.uky.edu. Uh, so I think that went down uh, f four levels. Uh, so the original um, top-level domains, there were seven of them. .arpa would be for organizations that were on ARPANET. .com, of course, is for businesses. .edu is for educational institutions. .gov is for government entities. .mil was for the military. And .NET was originally created for kind of technical people associated with the infrastructure of the Internet. And then finally, .org, which is supposed to be kind of everybody else. A lot of nonprofits are in .org. Uh, back when I created my family domain out of this list, um, dot org uh, was the most appropriate at the time so I have a dot org uh, domain uh, in 2001-2002 time frame there were 15 new top-level domains added uh, they're in your main textbook on pages 872 and 873 so you might take a look at that um, in 1985 uh, country codes were added, so this would be .us for the United States, .jp for Japan, um, I think China's .cn. Uh, so every country um, had a code. Um, in 2018, there were 59 approved country codes. Um, what, one interesting story is every country was given a domain. Uh, there was a very um, small island I, as shown here on uh, this map. Uh, Tuvalu is how I would uh, pronounce that. Uh, they got .tv as their domain name. Uh, they're a very small island off Australia and at the time uh, being about 1998 uh, they didn't think they would ever have internet, so they didn't think they needed this domain. And dot .t matches up, of course, with television. So what they did is they sold the rights to the dot .tv domain until 2048 for $50 million plus royalties. And those royalties they make off that domain by basically reselling it makes up 10% of the country's uh, revenue. So that's just kind of an interesting thing uh, based on, you know, I don't know if there's a .tu uh, or, you know, why they made a .tv, but they kind of lucked out and got a name that a lot of people in television uh, desired at the time. Now then, um, go talk about the DNS process when you have um, local DNS. That is, you know, KCTCS, whose domain name is kctcs.edu. They have domain servers located in the system office uh, in uh, Versailles. So if you're on a machine that has local DNS, um, you have a client that asks for name resolution. So resolution or resolving the domain or resolving the FQDN is the process of looking it up so that you can get an IP address so that you can communicate with the host. So the client computer says, hey, I would like to resolve this name because I want to communicate with this machine. So that client computer asks the local domain server for resolution. Now, using our KCTCS example, if you're on campus, the machine you're on, let's say you're going to google.com, it asks the DNS servers in Versailles. And it's only going to have kctcs.edu um, machines in it 
for the most part. So it's not going to, to know the name. So what happens is um, if the local server by chance can resolve the request, for example, if you were on campus going to netlab.bluegrass.kctcs.edu, it would be able to resolve that name. If so, it just returns the IP address back to the client requesting the name resolution. If the local name server cannot resolve the, the request, it asks a root domain server, give me the name server for the top level domain. You know, if we're going to google.com, that would be give me a name server that handles .com name resolutions. Um, so, um, have a repetition there. Um, so then the local DNS server is going to ask the top level domain server to resolve the name. And that name server is going to return information on the name server that handles the second level domain dot tt dot um, tld top level domain um, then the local name server is going to ask that second level domain uh, server to resolve the subdomain uh, which would be second hyphen level domain dot tdl so like google.com and this process continues um, for however many different levels you have until the name is resolved. Now then, uh, DNS um, packets have headers. This is the format of just the header, not the entire packet. So we start out with a two byte ID which, like a lot of things, is a randomly generated value that uniquely identifies the request so that when DNS servers reply, we can match that back to the request that was made. We have um, two bytes of flags, and there's a lot of flags in there, so I'm going to break out that two-byte field on the next slide. So this is what it looks like. Notice that the, the ruler at the top, or whatever you want to call it, is now in bits instead of bytes. So the QR flag stands for query response. So if it's zero, it's a query. If it's set to one or true, it's a response. We then have an opcode, which is four bits. Uh, a zero is a standard query. That, that's a very common value for it to be set to. Uh, AA is did we have an authoritative answer? Uh, true, false. An authoritative answer means the answer came from the name server that is responsible for the domain or subdomain that you're resolving the machine in. Um, so true means it comes from a machine. False is kind of like, well, I heard it from a friend of a friend of a friend uh, that this might be the IP address. Probably going to be correct, but it did not come from authoritative uh, DNS. The next flag, the TC flag, tells whether or not the message was truncated. The RD, um, do we want recursion? Do we want to recurse down through the domain? This is often true. Uh, is recursion available on the server you're talking to? Uh, you have a, f a field called Z. I'm not really sure why it's named Z instead of like RV or something, but uh, regardless, this is a reserved field and is currently always set to zero. And then finally, you have a response code, which is what the R code stands for. It's four bits in length. And here's some of the, the more common values. Uh, zero means everything was successful. Um, in Unix, it often uses zero as, you know, the command or the function or whatever you're doing uh, completed uh, successfully. So that's all the flags. So we'll go back to the actual header. We're up to QD count, which is the number of questions. 
um, in the question session and on a query um, this should this will be set to one um, AN account is the number of entries that we have in the answer section NS is the number of name server resource records we have again in the response and then AR count is additional records um, and we'll see some of these uh, what these different types of resource records are um, here in a moment so uh, resource records are basically information about a DNS, a DNS object and these resource records follow immediately after the DNS header in the packets and each of the resource records have the following format uh, so we have a name that is variable length um, and this is the node to which the resource records pertain to um, it starts with a one byte value that tells how many values are in the name and then after that it contains the name that you want to resolve or the name that has been resolved and from the C programming language which was the programming language um, of Unix machines and what Unix was ultimately written in you end strings by having a null value which is a byte that contains all uh, resource or all zeros. Um, the type tells what kind of resource record we have. One is an address record, five is a change name. We'll look at all the possible record types after we finish talking about the, the resource record fields. Uh, we have a class. Uh, we've seen this before in some other packets we're looking at. Um, one, it basically tells what type of network it is. A one means this is an internet um, class or a machine that is on the internet. Uh, we have a time to live, which is four bytes. This tells how long the entry can be cached. Um, what this comes from is if you're talking and make run request to google.com, uh, it's likely that there's going to be a number of packets flowing back and forth between google.com so it records this in its cache um, the IP to fully qual I'm sorry fully qualified domain name to IP address and this tells how long to keep that in cache before you actually expire it remove it from the cache and then the next time you go to google.com you have to go through the name resolution part again um, RD length tells how long uh, the data is in the resource record. So, so this is pretty variable. You have to start with a variable length name and then you have variable length um, data fields uh, within each of the resource records. So um, you then have the the data section which is RD length and bytes that actually describes the resource so let's dive in and look at a query packet so on the left side of this slide the in packet tracer I've select domain name system over in the right it is highlighted the part of the record the entire uh, query so let's go through and kind of look at this so the first thing we had is the transaction ID so 1A95 in the hexadecimal was the ID of this uh, DNS request um, here are the flags um, you know I won't go down and break it into the eight or so individual fields but basically this means it's a standard query then we have how many questions were there there was only one question and since this is a query uh, the answer resource records doesn't apply so it's zero we're not getting any authority or additional resource records back so they're all zero 
So that finishes up the header of this query packet. So continuing on, uh, this is the one question that we have. So um, the three, um, I'm, I'm going to take the rest of this resource record and write it linearly so that I can go through and talk about this. So the, the length is basically how many parts do we have in the name. So we have the first part, which is www, followed by what in Unix is called an end of text indicator. So this is www.uky.edu. So I was, I think, on my laptop trying to resolve www.uky. .edu. Uh, here's the null that terminates the string. Uh, the type is A, which means it's an address record, so I'm giving you the name. I want the IP address back. And the class for most of the things we're going to see these days is going to be 1, uh, which means uh, this we're talking to the internet, this machine is on the internet. Uh, so, that query was sent to the DNS server, and here is the response that I got back. Um, here's the transaction ID that matches up with the transaction ID in the request. Um, 8180 hexadecimal, if you break all these flags out, basically means this is a query response. One question was asked. I have two answers for you. I have no authority resource records and I have no additional resource records. So like I did before, I'm going to take the rest of this DNS query and uh, which is um, this part right here and I'm going to put it linearly like I did before so that we can talk about these. So. Um, this basically um, says that this is an alias in 12 bytes into the record we will find the name so the www.uky.edu so that's uh, telling us that uh, this is a, a C name um, record uh, it is an internet uh, class here is the time to live for this packet. Uh, the response is seven bytes in length. The first thing is we have a name, which is four, which is www3. And then this is an offset into the record where the rest of the domain is. So th this is really weird how it's done. and. Can kind of be a pain to decode so that's uh, you know one reason Wireshark is really nice is it can take these offsets and piece it back together and say that the response was www3.uky.edu um, there is a second uh, resource record uh, the second answer is this uh, again um, if we decode these this is an alias and we go 41 bytes into the record to find the name it is an address record on the internet here is the time to live for this response our data length is four and each of these pieces of data if we convert them to decimal is 128 163 35 46 and what that's representing is if we piece those all together and put periods between them, it is the decimal dotted notation 128.163.35.46, which is the IP address of the machine www.uky.edu, which is an alias for www.uky.edu, our main web server domain at the University of Kentucky. So, I told you I'd go back and tell you the types. 
So um, if we go through, the type value is the number that is in the, the record. Uh, the text code is how we refer to it. For example, if we're looking up an address, uh, we would call that an A record. And an A record is um, a 32-bit IP address, so an IP version 4 address. Uh, a type of 2 means this is a name server. In particular, it is the name server with authority for the zone. Uh, 5 is a C name. Um, a lot of people call it uh, a change name, which is accurate, but uh, the technical name is a canonical name, and it is an alias. Uh, so you have a name that points to another name, for example. Uh, 6 is start of authority. Uh, this has the name of the zone, the authoritative server, and contact information for the domain. A pointer record points to another location in the namespace. 15 is an MS record, MX record. It's likely that I will demonstrate this in uh, a homework assignment um, and have you look at this. But an example would be, you know, you send me mail at wayne.beach at kctcs.edu. So there, depending on what you're doing, uh, there may or may not be a machine named kctcs.edu. But basically, there is an MX record in the DNS that says if somebody's trying to read mail for kctcs.edu, you know, go to outlook.microsoft.com, some machine within Microsoft 365. So it points you somewhere else to a machine that is responsible for email in the domain that you specified. And then relatively new are text records. And these can be arbitrary text. Uh, the one place I've seen this used is if you're trying to verify a website with Google for a Google search engine. Uh, they will tell you, okay, there's three things you can do. You can either put at the top level of your domain a file with some name that we'll look at to verify that you can control the server, or you can put a text record in your DNS to prove that you either manage or know somebody who manages the DNS for the domain and therefore are likely giving valid information about a web server. And then when IP version 6 came in, uh, this name, somebody was kind of thinking, is an AAAA record. So IP version 6 addresses are four times as long as a IP version 4. So we have an A record for IP version 4. We have AAAA for IP version 6. So kind of a play on words, you will, based on the fact that it's a 128-bit um, address as opposed to a 32-bit address. Uh, we talked about domain contacts. Every domain has three different contacts. Uh, there is an administrative contact who is considered to be the owner of the domain. There is a billing contact who is responsible for payments for the domain. And the technical contact, as the name implies, is somebody that's technical that knows how to set up and manage um, your domain. Uh, there is a command on Unix called whois. And you can say who is space and give a domain name, and it will return you the three uh, contacts for the domain. Uh, when the web came out at some point, somebody grabbed whois.com website, uh, which has a nice web interface where you can enter the name, and it will come back and uh, tell you who the three contacts are. Sometimes it's the same person uh, for smaller organizations, but for somebody like UK and probably KCTCS, it's going to be three different people. 
Um, we talked about the root servers a bit ago. There are 13 of them. And if you go to this website, the IANA is the Internet Authority for, um, or the Internet Address and Name Authority, I think is what that stands for. And here's a URL that will tell you uh, what those 13 servers are. And they usually have pretty generic names like A dot, B dot, etc. Now, uh, one topic that is briefly covered in your book that I want to talk about that's pretty important is dynamic um, DNS. So what that name means is you have a machine whose IP address may change over time and you would like its associated DNS record uh, to change as well. So we're going to go back to our common home setup which we saw a few lectures ago uh, which looks like this. You have an ISP, you have a router, and then in your home you have, you know, some number of devices. Uh, you know, used to it used to be common for people to have a single computer, uh, but these days you may have a desktop computer, you may have a laptop computer. If you have a family or roommates, they may have laptops and or desktops. Uh, you know, cell phones, um, talk to Wi-Fi. Uh, smart TVs talk to Wi-Fi your gaming consoles talk to Wi-Fi so you know this may be as small as one or two but um, in discussion with some students you know this might be 10 or 15 depending upon how many devices um, you have and how many individuals um, you have in your home uh, the important thing for this is to notice that you have a public IP on the ISP side of your router and then you have a private IP that's actually in the same network as, as your home. So in this picture 192.168.0.0 uh, network. Uh, the router runs something called NAT so that all the devices in your home can simultaneously if necessary communicate with the internet capital I. Um, so that's just kind of a, a refresher on the setup. So why do we care about dynamic DNS? I've already told you the first one is you have an IP that may change over time. So that would be your public IP uh, from your service provider. It might change over time. I know with Spectrum and its predecessors, uh, typically my IP address doesn't change unless there is a power outage. Um, it might also change if the company was um, doing maintenance. Now the reason I want a DNS entry uh, for my machine is so that if I'm out I can you know secure shell or access other resources within my home from outside my home. Um, so, you know, I might want to connect um, from KCTCS um, lab or classroom to my home server. And I can do that if I know the IP address uh, of my router, or in this case, have associated a name uh, with that that's going to be kept up to date. Uh, the other thing I've used it before is, you know, if I had a power outage, and I thought the power was going to be off for a really long time. Me and my family might go to a movie or we might go out to eat. And then I can try to secure shell into my server. And if I can't, that most likely means my electricity is still off. Uh, but if I can secure shell in, that means my router is working and my server is up. Then I know my electricity is, is probably on. Uh, so that's the reason that we care about it. Now, issues with this is the main one, which is your public IP address is going to change over time. And you need a DNS server to assign a name and track your IP address so that you can easily get back to it. Um, so, um, 
we have things called dynamic DNS services. And this is the DNS part of it. Now, when I first started doing this for my home machine many, many years ago, I used a site called dynamicdns.com. And it was free. And it was very, very nice. And then all of a sudden, I can't remember when, but probably 10 plus or minus years ago, uh, they said, oh, yeah, we're, we're still going to provide you with this great service. But now it's $55 a year, which is way more than I thought it was worth. <coughs> Excuse me. So I switched over to noip.com. And this is free for basic dynamic DNS services for a single host name, which most of the time that's all you care about. You have a single IP address on your router that you want to map. There are other DNS um, services out there that you can search for, but what happens is you need an update process. So you need something that can detect your IP address has changed and supply that to your dynamic uh, DNS server. Now, some routers support this directly. Uh, my old router supported dynamicdns.com. Um, uh, my current router um, supports noip.com. And I think my router, my current one, may support one other service uh, that I hadn't heard about. Um, I have gone through a couple of routers over the last few years uh, because of storm and lightning damage. And I hadn't actually set it back up on my um, current setup um, until I was preparing for this lecture. Now, if your router doesn't support it, which is common, I don't know how common, but it, not all routers do, um, you can run software inside a, com or a computer inside your home you know, hopefully it's, you know, not your laptop. Hopefully it would be, you know, a machine that's always on and like a desktop. And it can detect when the IP address changes and notify your dynamic DNS server or service of that. Uh, for this to work, you also need to be aware of something called port forwarding. Uh, so basically to... Um, get to a resource inside your home, which would often be you want a secure shell into a machine, or you want to use a web browser to get to a web browser running in your home. Uh, so for this example, I'm going to look at SSH because that's what I typically care about. So the way you would use SSH is you would say SSH into your user ID on the machine in your home, at whatever name you chose, dot no IP dot me. Um, so secure shell is on port 22. So your secure shell client would connect to port 22 on your router. And then your router will have a port forwarding table that looks like this. So if I get a connection from the outside port, I want you to go to this host inside my home and use this port number on that machine. Now, the, my router has more than this. Like for example, I can have an outside host or host range and say, you know, if it comes from a machine at UK or KCTCS, uh, then forward it. Uh, so, you know, mine has a little extra security, if you will. Uh, a little more control, but this is kind of the bare minimum for this forwarding table. So it's going to look something like this. If somebody connects from the outside to port 22 on my router, I want you to go to the machine inside my house that has the IP 192.168.0.32 and connect to it on port 22. Uh, if I get a connection from the outside to port 80, then I want to go to 192.168.0.10 on port 80. You know, so you can change the inside port, but 
I'd say it's more common that you don't, you know. Secure Shell runs on port 22, so you want to keep it on port 22, for example. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is some DNS-related commands, and you'll probably get to experiment with these in a homework. The first one is NSLOOKUP. Um, you know, used to it said NSLOOKUP was for testing your DNS, which, which is true. Uh, but this allows you to query inactive, interactively uh, your name server. So I can say NSLOOKUP www.uky.edu and it will come back in a nice format that we'll see here in a second and tell me information about the machine I asked for. Um, this is pre-installed on Windows machines and um, has been on all Unix and Linux machines since DNS um, came out. So here I was looking up um, bluegrass.kctcs.edu. It tells me um, the name of the server, which often there will be a name here. Uh, like at UK, it used to be ncc.uky.edu, but this just gives me the IP address for the server name and the IP address um, as the address. So this is the server I was talking to. And actually, since I was at home doing this, these are 128.163 IP addresses, which are UK addresses. So I asked the UK name server to resolve bluegrass.kctcs.edu. It gave back a non-authoritative answer because UK doesn't have information on kctcs.edu machines, but it came back and said, that name you asked me for, its IP address is 67.208.145.191. Uh, so in this example, I put the query on the command line. Now, you can go into interactive mode just by typing nslookup. So I typed nslookup. Uh, it, told, it started up. I said, I want to know about kctcs.edu. It gave me the same information. Uh, then I wanted to change the type to an MS record. And then I said kctcs.edu again. And it came back and gave me kctcs-edu.mail.protection.outlook.com. So that's actually where um, your kctcs email is running, and outlook.com is uh, Microsoft. And then it gave me some more information. It says, here's the three name servers for this domain, and here's their IP addresses. Um, and then basically gave me the prompt back so if I wanted to continue on and do other um, DNS lookups I can. So NS lookups been around since 1984. Um, it is slowly being replaced by a program um, called DIG. Uh, DIG is pre-installed on most um, Unix Linux machines and if you want to have it on Windows machines, it's probably not going to be there. You probably need to install Bind. And when you install the Bind Resolver, uh, DIG uh, comes with it. So I have an example on the next slide so that I can hopefully make it big enough that you might be able to read it. Uh, so I said diggoogle.com. Notice that it's decoding some of the information in the packet. It gives me a summary of the header. It tells me what the flags are, including um, how many um, records of different types there are. So there's one query, one answer, four authorities, and nine additional records. Um, so the answer section basically says google.com is 142.251.32.14. Um, here's four name servers and here's an additional um, section that has the IP version 4 and IP version 6 addresses uh, for the four name servers that Google is running. Tells me how long the query took um, 
and you know what time it returned the information and that type. So this lecture is a, a little bit longer than uh, some of the other ones, uh, but DNS is kind of a big topic, and that finishes up our discussion or lecture on DNS.